Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Football Night in the Solar System. Tonight or today, depending upon where you are viewing us from, features a classic matchup of rivals as old as the formation of the solar system itself and the orbital mechanics that govern our worlds. The heavy favorites on the red gridiron today are those who have owned this series. The Martian Red Warriors have dominated all the terrestrial teams since the league instituted the controversial Rule 18. Inventing the game has done nothing to help the humans who have become button-pushing nerds. If the Earth wants to compete in 2040 or 2479, they will need more than good coaching when uh, they come out of the tunnel itself to face the hostile crowd. Joining me for color commentary and historical context is the author of Astounding, the History of Golden Age Science Fiction, Alec Neville Lee. And our play-by-play today will be provided by Coach Seth Heasley, who has spent the last few football seasons as the host of Who Goes There, the podcast that is reading all the Hugo-nominated novels, and Take Me to Your Reader, which covers adapted science fiction. So on that note, welcome Seth and Alec to Postcards from a Dying World. It is excellent to have you both here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, on a more serious note, I'm going to get into a better introduction for you guys before we get started <laughs> on talking about Rule 18. I don't know, maybe that will serve for the uh, a little bit of the introduction that we need for what the story is about. We understand that Rule 18, the, the story we are covering for the second episode of the 1930 science fiction podcast series that I'm doing is one that is hard to find. It's rarely collected. Outside of the Internet Archive, I'm not sure where you could read it these days. I'm not sure if it's in print at all. So I know some of you are just going to come and listen for cliff notes. So we will go into the story. But first, I do want to get into a little bit more of the bona fides of my guests. Starting with Alec. um, Yes, you are the author. And this episode is going to have a couple of extra things that are going to be visual. So as much as I know the audio is going to sound better, um, you might want to hop on over to YouTube to watch the video because we're gonna have I'm gonna have a few visual aids, not a ton, so you'll be fine and we'll explain them. But Alec is the author of this book, Astounding, which I just finished rereading for the second time because I had to put all these highlights in the book. So I have now read Astounding two times. Alec, tell the folks who you are and what your nerdy history is. Uh, well, thanks. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, um, I'm the author of uh, the book Astounding, a uh, full title, uh, John W. Campbell, Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, L. Ron Hubbard, and the Golden Age of Science Fiction, uh, which was a Hugo and De Locus Awards finalist a few years ago. Um, and yeah, I have a background in writing short science fiction. I was a longtime uh, writer uh, of short stories for Analog, which is kind of how I entered into this whole thing. And, um, you know, I, I've done a lot of other stuff in different, uh, you know, places, but, but I think within the science fiction community, you know, astounding is, is still the thing I'm best known for. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure you mentioned this short story and this the, the whole impact that it had in there. If you didn't, I'm, I know you talked about um, a- Asimov and uh, Simak's relationship, uh, Simak's relationship, which we will get into um, once we get into the story. Seth, um, now, oh, and I should note that if you want more deep dives into Alex's history, um, we I've had him on the Dickheads podcast twice. We did an episode on cancel culture with uh, Professor Lisa Yazik, which is a really good um, episode, which talks a lot about John W. Campbell, who's a huge um, role in this episode as well. So um, I highly recommend that. And then um, I can't, I I know I had you on, oh, with the scholars, we were all on together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, That was the other time you were on Dickheads. I knew you were on twice, Alec. Um, And you were with Seth one of those times on dickheads seth and i have podcasted many times together 
uh, mostly on his show, uh, mm -hmm. where we covered the dispossessed uh, most recently, and we covered uh, some act with Waystation on who goes there. Uh, so we can talk a little bit more about that. But Seth, tell everybody your nerdy history. Yeah, I mean, kind of a lifelong nerd. My dad was was a big nerd chemistry professor for 40 years in Anchorage, Alaska, and um, big fan of things like Star Trek and Star Wars and Buck Rogers from way back in the day. Um, I really was not very well read in science fiction, and that's where kind of the origin of my podcast comes from, because I had at some point looked at lists of science fiction books that nerds should have read and realized that I had not really read many of them, and uh so I was already a podcaster with Take Me to Your Reader, and I had a network of people that I knew I could re reach out to um, if I wanted to work through a list and have different guests on. So that's what I did with Hugo's there. And I'm, I think I'm at episode 69 of that show coming up probably next weekend. I'm going to be recording that one. You're getting um, really where, close to done, aren't you? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And so I'm starting to think about what's, what's my exit strategy or like continuation strategy to keep the feed active. So... Yeah, we're we took a huge break from dickheads because we realized we we're really close to the end. Yeah, um, yeah we're covering Valis next, and so we're we're getting pretty close to the end. So I I feel yeah I've I've, I've had those same thoughts. It's funny because yeah. when you start, it seems so far away. You think you'll never get there, big time. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, it's a it's a big deal. And if you're new to my podcast, if you came here for Rule Eighteen. And you don't know me. My name is David Agronoff. I'm um, author, podcaster, and my other show is the Dickheads Podcast. So I mostly focus a lot of my research on Philip K. Dick and kind of new wave era um, science fiction. I'm a big John Bruner fan, and my nerdy history is that um, yeah, life lifelong sci-fi reader, uh, basically. But I should hope. At this point, I don't need to introduce myself as much because I'm the host of the show. So let's get going. Um, so rule 18, the reason why I wanted to do this one, and we'll talk more about this later. And the whole idea of this series was that um, I just happened to, to, to read a couple of 1930s science fiction together and, and had a thought to myself that the 30th science fiction is underrated that it's a really good era for science fiction and people don't think about the 1930s as being a, a really good era for science fiction, but it is. So um, maybe Alec, could you give us a little bit of a background on where science fiction was in the 1930s and then we'll talk about Clifford Smack. Sure, so you know, my, my answer to this question is gonna be very astounding centric, uh, you know, because this is the magazine I know best. Um, but I can say kind of in general that, you know, you're, you're right. Um, one thing I say about science fiction in the 30s is that um, the artwork is pretty amazing right from the beginning. You know, like Absolutely. the covers and the illustrations are wonderful. You know, they're yeah. fun to look at. Um, the experience of going back to read the stories themselves is often not as fun as uh, looking at the art. <laughs> Um, and I, I say this as someone who has read a lot of uh, 30s science fiction, um, but it, it is developing, right? And, and the, the, the era we're talking about here, 37, 38, 39, is an incredibly important moment where you sort of see science fiction evolve into not quite a, its modern state, but it's, it's getting there. And, and the biggest development, at least, uh, you know, that, that I see is that, um, you know, early on in the 30s, uh, you have many, you know, pulp science fiction magazines that, that are doing well, but the, the stories for the most part are being written by uh, pulp authors who are already established in other genres. So you have people who have written adventure fiction, nautical fiction, military fiction, who just sort of, you know, change the location and, and they'll write like a military science fiction story set on Mars, right? But it's, you know, they're, they're drawing on the same tropes, the same conventions, and, you know, you're not seeing a lot of innovation um, at this stage. And then around, you know, this period, what, what starts to happen, and, you know, this is really interesting for reasons that we'll get, probably get into later on, is that um, number one, um, someone like John W. Campbell, 
uh, you know, becomes the editor of Astounding in, in 37. And Campbell will discuss him, I think, a little bit further later. You know, he is more ambitious. He has his big ideas for the genre and he wants to sort of um, modernize it. He wants to improve the science. He wants to improve the writing and the characterization, you know, and this is his, these are his objectives, you know, and, and he's very clear about this. So that, that that's a big part of the story. And the other part of the story that I think we're going to talk about later is the fact that this is the point at which um, science fiction fans start to try to write stories themselves. So this is not just the the pulp uh, author, you know, trying to make a living. This is the young person who has been reading uh, magazines like Amazing Stories since they were teenagers. And they love science fiction for its own sake. They want to write science fiction because they love the genre itself, which is a big development. And, and so you start to see people like Isaac Asimov, who will, you know, come up later on, uh, you know, start as fans, um, maybe by writing letters to the magazine or by uh, joining fan clubs, but they also want to start writing stories. And so the the early attempts are pretty crude, um, or you know at least they're amateurish. But later on, you know there is this sort of like a like a shift in tone where, um, you know, it's not just about uh, pulp writers earning a living. It's about people who love science fiction who are trying to um, you know kind of make that big jump from fan to writer. Right. And if you look at the letters from this era, you're going to see all kinds of, in the letter sections, you're going to see all kinds of names of people who would go on to become famous writers. Uh, some that I, you know, Philip K. Dick, who, who we found one of his childhood houses, which by the way, was a very short walk from Ursula Le Guin's childhood home, even though they never met each other. Um, only because this letter was in an, an uh, was in an issue of Amazing Stories, and we wow. would never have found this house, and uh, eventually let the lady know who's lived there since the '60s that Philip K. Dick used to live in her house. Um, you know, we would have never known that without the letter section because they would put their addresses in, and then everybody would start writing each other too, and that's how early fandom began. Another one that uh, I think is great is like Walter Tevis is one who wrote Queen, who's most famous for having written Queen's Gambit and The Hustler, had um, a letter in an early magazine. And that's kind of the evidence we have of the childhood fandom that some of these writers had. It's, it's the letter section is very important. We'll get more into that. But let's talk about... Side note, uh, David, yeah. can you imagine what how different uh, internet dialogue would be if you had to put your home address on every comment you made online? Right, right, right. Well, exactly. And but um, it's interesting when you start doing the research into this, and Alec can speak to this too, is that you see they're having the same kinds of arguments just in slow motion, <laughs> you know, through snail mail and through months later in the issues. And, you know, and a lot of these letters, like Walter Tevis's letter to Wonder Stories, was just him saying, I liked this story. I liked this story. I did not like this one. I did not like that one, you know? And so what a, a lot of these letter sections were doing was, was the fans letting the editors know, I like this style of story and I don't like this style of story. And if you think about it, th that's really valuable. And one of the reasons why I think Samak took, uh, Samak took a big growth here out of this is because he was listening to the letters, right? Not, I don't know how many of the authors did, but so let's, let's, let's get into, into Simak and Cl he, Clifford Simak. And, and I know I'm going to say, I'm going to switch. I'm going to try to pronounce it the correct way, but I have a lifetime saying it <laughs> the other way. Um, I've read his work consistently since the nineties. The nineties is when I discovered him. And I think I mentioned this on, um, and I had the guy who introduced me to, to his work on the Dickheads episode about Waystation. So I've podcasted twice about Waystation. Um, and that is uh, my friend, Matthew Whitaker, who's a bass player in a, in a local noise band, famous noise band in my area called the Belgian Waffles. And the first thing he said to me was, and I remember this, and this is important to the story is, this guy's been writing science fiction so long, a teenage Isaac Asimov wrote a letter to him. <laughs> that was the way it was described to me. And that's a, so important to this story. And I was interested, I was like, oh, this guy influenced Asimov. That's interesting to me. I didn't know any of the details beyond that. That's all I was told. But that's, that's how I was introduced to his work. 
And the first thing I read, I believe was um, Ring Around the Sun is the first one I read. But um, I quickly dived into a whole bunch of his works and City to this day is my absolute favorite um, Simak work, but we'll get more into his whole canon. Let's talk about his early life. He was um, a journalist and a newspaper man and he grew up in the Midwest and when he got out of college and was going around doing his journalism thing, he, he, what he was known for is trying to save or shut down small newspaper, satellite newspaper offices in little towns around the Midwest. And I think that's very important to this story because he was going around like to places in Iowa, Wisconsin, and he'd have like gigs for six months to a year um running these small papers until after he wrote this story he that was what he was doing in his life when he wrote this story so he started writing science fiction during this period when he was moving around to all these newspapers but it was in the late 30s that he got a job at the minneapolis tribune which by the way is my father's hometown um and he was born in 1936 so they were I, I don't know how close they lived to each other, but they were in the same town. Um, but he ended, before he ended up in Minneapolis, he was going around doing these small town papers. So you know what he's going to see a lot of in the Midwest? is football. <laughs> he's going to see a lot of football in that era. And I think, and so if, you know, we've already kind of introduced the idea that this story is about football. But before he got there, he wrote a couple other stories all of his original stories, this was his first story for Astounding, but he originally published in a magazine called Wonder Stories. I don't know much about Wonder Stories. I've never read Wonder Stories. I've never looked back in the archive. Alec, do you know anything about who was doing that magazine and anything about it? Because I don't. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, this is. I, think I didn't expect is, you to. <laughs> right. I mean, isn't, isn't this a, a Grinspec magazine or am I, am I um, you know, getting that wrong? Um, again, my, my it might knowledge have been a, a, a spinoff of Amazing Stories. Yeah. OK, yes, yes. I, I think it was a Grinspec magazine. And at that point, my knowledge of it ends. Um, yeah. All I know, I believe that Wonder Stories published Stanley Weinbaum, who was one of the great writers from this period. Um, you know, he died very young. And I think if he had had lived, we'd be talking about him, you know, in the same sentence as, as people like Asimov. Um, but yeah, my, my knowledge of that magazine is pretty limited. Yeah, mine too. I, I looked a little bit into it, um, but I don't think it's as famous of a one. However, we do know that his first story, um, I was like, I know it has son in the title and I'm brain farting what it was, but his very first story is one that Asimov, uh, mentioned as one that he liked as well and so he had published about six stories before this and um i'm pretty sure we, you and i i don't know if uh seth has seen it but there's a there's there's very little like public interviews that you can watch or listen to with with clifford smack but one is the the james gunn one from from the late from the late 60s early 70s i think it's early 70s and um he does talk about in, in this interview and you can find it on YouTube. So I'll put a link to it. Um, and it's a great interview. And um, one of the things about that is he does talk about wanting to write for Astounding about how when John W. Campbell took over that he was very excited about the direction that it was going. And he saw John W. Campbell as somebody that he could write for. And um, you know, he mentions writing the, the story, he doesn't go too deeply into it, but he says, you know, like that he wrote a story about football game, a football game on Mars. And, you know, I, I do think that it, it, it's valuable to, to think about the role and talk about the role that John W. Campbell plays in this. And, and the, the history of John W. Campbell, in hindsight, like I know he gets a pretty rough, Right, but I think you and I both feel that his history is so important to the genre and that it needs study. So tell, tell everybody about what John W. Campbell's role is. And by the way, the next episode of this series, we're going to do one of his stories who goes there um, with Tim Levin, Mary San Giovanni, and Brian Keene. So we'll get more into him as a writer in the next episode. But uh, yeah, an editor. 
Yeah, no, the, so the sequence is, here is actually very important. Um, so, so Campbell becomes editor of Astounding in October of 37. Um, and prior to him, the editor is a guy named F. Orlin Tremaine, who I think is actually very underrated. He's, he's a good editor who published some really good stories. He, you know, he published um, H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness um, and, and uh, The Shadow Out of Time. And, you know, what was really kind of moving the magazine in the right direction. Um, but he gets promoted to a position where he is uh, or kind of overseeing multiple titles um, at the publisher Street and Smith. And so he has to bring in like a editor to oversee Astounding, um, you know, on its own. And Campbell is at that point already Already a very well-regarded author. You know, he's written uh, what we call super science stories under his own name, which are these kind of like big planet-destroying, you know, epic, uh, very, very, you know, kind of like cardboard characters, but big ideas, uh, you know, kind of stories. Um, and then as John, uh, Don A. Stewart, his pen name, he's published some really good stories. You know, Twilight uh, was probably the first big story he published under that name. Oh, I love Twilight. It's a great uh, story. And yes, you know, so like a different level, you know, quality altogether. And as you mentioned, Who Goes There, which, you know, was later adapted famously as The Thing, uh, is a story that he has just finished writing and he is pitching it essentially to Tremaine you know, in the fall of 37. And he kind of gets the job of editor almost by accident. You know, he is not actively seeking this job, but he is there. He is available. He is um, someone that Tremaine knows. And he's a writer that uh, writers respect, you know, and fans respect. So, you know, at this point, you know, he... Uh, his, his best stories are written as Donnie Stewart, and I would say it's an open secret among, uh, you know, science fiction writers that, you know, Campbell is Stewart. And so for someone like uh, Simak, uh, it's sort of, it, it's, a, it's a game changer, right? He, he respects Campbell's um, talent. He understands that Campbell is moving the magazine in a new direction. And, and, and this is something that you see kind of in letters from this period, you know, the fans are excited, writers are excited, you know, this is a big deal for the magazine that Campbell's coming in. Um, the one thing I want to kind of quickly mention is that, you know, Tremaine already has a big backlog of stories that he's already acquired. And so uh, Campbell is not in full control of the magazine for I would say half a year, I would say in March of 38 is kind of when you start seeing stories that Campbell acquires in the magazine. And this is right around the time that um, that Simak uh, sends him rule 18. Um, and so this is interesting, right? This is one of the first big stories that Campbell acquires. And he I actually have a letter that he wrote saying that, you know, he's getting a lot of new uh, you know, submissions from um both like established writers and newer writers and that uh, that Simak is sending him some of the best stuff. So so this story, you know, even before we bring in um, the reaction of fans like like Asimov, you know, the story is appearing at kind of a hinge point. Right. It's I mean, we'll talk about its merits, you know, later, but, um, you know, it's, it's a good story. It's a story that still holds up. That's fun to read. That has, you know, a good premise. And, and you're kind of seeing like some of the kinds of uh, fiction that Campbell is acquiring and the Campbell's uh, presence at the magazine is uh, starting to inspire writers to submit. Yeah, and before we get really into Rule 18, um, and what, one really great example that the Donna Stewart thing, what was a known thing is that An uh, Anthony Boucher, 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 whoever, however you want to say it, and his um, murder mystery, Rocket to the Morgue, which is kind of like a send up of science fiction, There, there's a joke. Mm -hmm about a, an editor whose name is Stuart um, and that everybody knows who he really is. I, mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact joke, but I remember that there's a right. joke in Rocket to the Morgue about it. Enough so that he was expecting some of the readers to get it. There's a lot of in jokes for science fiction fans in Rocket to the Morgue, if you've never read it. Um, I highly recommend to people to, to read that um, because it's, it's like a locked door murder mystery, but it's also like a, a send up of science fiction of the of the late 30s of the golden age. So it's really great. Um, Seth, have you read any of um, John W. Campbell's um, early science fiction or is, is this something other than who goes there? No, okay. I don't think I've read anything else by Campbell. Yeah, I know. We're going to hear more from you when we get to rule 18. I'm sorry. I, we're I do have a, a copy history. of uh, of Frozen Hell, though. The oh, good. expanded one, yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, can, can I plug this for a second? Yeah, um, yeah this absolutely. Is, 
this is the uh, original uncut draft of Who Goes There, which I discovered while doing research for Astounding in a box of Campbell's papers at Harvard that no one had looked at in decades. And um, it has like 45 pages of new material and it got published. Uh, it's a very nice looking book. I wrote the preface uh, along with Robert Silverberg. So yeah, I, I definitely recommend people pick up a copy of that. Yeah. Um, and look, listen, as somebody who's dug around the archives, uh, I, I I, every time you talk about frozen hell, it gets me really excited. <laughs> it's a cool thing that you, you saw. Um, the, the most I've found that I don't know that anyone's talked about is a one page outline <laughs> for Philip K. Dick. And I'm like, oh, that one page outline made me feel like so excited. I can't imagine what it was like to find that frozen hell. Can you give us just a little bit about what's going, I mean, you had to, let's, let's talk about Campbell's papers because I'm sure you, those papers had a lot of these, stories and submissions and did you get to see some of these as the as he marked as how he marked them up so so there, there are different um you know sort of um collections of campbell's papers in different places okay and, and for me the um the, the the obvious thing to go for uh, uh were his letters and unfortunately a lot of the correspondence from this period has been lost um you, you know there are some good um troves of letters uh, that have been preserved elsewhere. But unfortunately, um, the editorial stuff, I would say 90% or more is gone, uh, you know, which is a real shame because it would have been amazing to see, you know, his original correspondence with people like, uh, like Simak. Um, so those letters uh, I was able to find like fairly easily uh, because uh, a fan named Perry Chapdelaine uh, acquired them from Campbell's widow in the seventies and actually microfilmed them all. And so I was able to get copies of those microfilm reels from the Library of Congress and some other places. And I just kind of went through thousands of pages of Campbell's letters, you know, to kind of pick up whatever information seemed useful. And then the box I looked at at Harvard, this is a separate box of Campbell's own manuscripts. So these are the manuscripts that he would have kept for his uh, short stories, um, mm. the ones he wrote under his own name, the ones he wrote as a Donna Stewart, uh, some nonfiction articles that he'd written. Um, and at first I didn't think it was really worth looking at because I was like, you know, like I'm more interested in him as an editor. Uh, I don't think I need to look at like the marked up version of, you know, some Campbell story from 1935. But I was like, you know what, what if there is something there that's cool that somebody else, you know, looks at someday? Um, you know, I, I would feel I would feel embarrassed if I had deliberately uh, chosen not to look there. <laughs> Right. Uh, right. So I'm always thinking about the, the next guy, like the next biographer who comes along, you know, who's going to like, you know, do all the things I didn't uh, do because I was too lazy or, you know, it was too careless. So, um, you know, I figured out these boxes were there. It was not easy because they do not show up on a casual search of the Harvard Library catalog. You have to like go down like four or five pages of, of results before you find this box. And literally Campbell sent this box there. I want to say in like the late 50s, maybe. And no one had touched it. It, it, it's, it was, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, it, it, no one even knew it was there. I'd never heard anyone mention this box. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I couldn't go there in person, but I hired a research assistant to go and just take PDFs of everything. And um, yeah, there was a folder called Frozen Hell, which I, I, I knew from other reading that uh, was the um, original uh, first draft title of uh, Who Goes There? And I was like, I should probably look at that. And, and you, you're right, like when I saw what was there, it took me a while to kind of understand what, what I had, but um, you know, it, it was, it was pretty cool. I, I don't think anything I've done before or since is going to match that particular discovery. Yeah, that, that is pretty, pretty wild. Now, Simak's relationship would have been all through letters because he was in the Midwest. And even though he went to some of the conventions and things, so they would have met each other in person and they would have had some of that, but unlike a lot of, you know, your Frederick Pauls, your Isaac Asimovs, they, like they're, they're routinely going to the astounding offices and picking Campbell's brain. And that's kind of an important part of those relationships that they had. But Camp Campbell would have only known Samac through, through the mail. And it's interesting to me that you say that he, he saw his work early on as being some of the the really, the really good stuff that was coming in. I think he obviously had a good eye for knowing who, who was going to be writing special stuff, but it seems to me that Simak was, was um, turning a corner too with his writing. Right. So let's actually get into rule 18. Um, Seth and I are going to try to break down the story. Seth, if you want to start. Yeah. Yeah. And then I will, I will help you out if you need it. So I, the I think story the elevator. Itself, 
<laughs> yeah, the the elevator pitch for this one is in order to climb out of a, I don't know, oh, for how many uh, years of losses in a football game between Earth and Mars, the coach on Earth somehow <laughs> makes use of time travel to collect the best football players from history in order to win the game. Right. Um, that I think sports radio would now discuss who you would go back in time to, to grab. Right. Um, we will not do that. Um, part well, of the- I, I would say just in terms of, I did write this down actually saying like you would pretty much just collect people from, from like right now, or, you know, before the whatever decline happened where people became button pressing nerds uh, because you're not going to go back and get Franco Harris. You're, you're going to get Barry Sanders and Barry Sanders probably isn't as good as the best running backs today, just because people are faster and stronger and bigger right. than they've ever been. Now um, that's one of the things. Okay. And one thing we have to mention the title rule 18, and we understand that some of you are, are not going to read this. So the title itself <laughs> refers to the, the reason why, mars beats up on earth in these games is because there is a rule rule 18 that all the players have to be native to the world that they're representing um going back like nine generations nine generations yeah and so there's some interesting science fiction ideas here and what what i think is really kind of cool about this story is simak is obviously playing on as a newspaper man in the Midwest, and he makes references to Wisconsin, Minnesota games in the in the story. He's traveling around the Midwest. The Packers were already a thing, by the way. And I guess we should mention this is one of the things that made me kind of laugh about uh, Isaac Asimov not liking this is that I had the thought of, well, is it just because he's a a, a nerdy guy that doesn't like sports ball <laughs> that he didn't get this story at all? Because me personally, I'm a sports guy. I, I, I like basketball and football. I'm not much of a baseball guy, but for me, yeah, I know you're a baseball guy. (laughs) Um, but like, you know, I get a lot of the, the jokes about football that are in this Mm -hmm. and specifically it's funny too, because, um, and I hate to, I'm, I'm not going to promote too much of my own stuff, but I did a similar, like a couple of years ago, I did a reading at the Lovecraft Fest and I wrote a star- story called the football team that never was about the Miskatonic football team. So um, I it kind of, I, I've, I've, I've written a funny football story before myself. And I personally, the thing that I liked most about rule 18 is I thought the story was hilarious especially the early parts about the news about um what was his name um jimmy no the uh the 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 reporter okay well first of all we can get into some of the details i think uh hap fallsworth hap fallsworth was <laughs> like the 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 gumshoe reporter that's going around well he's the editor isn't he i, th- I yeah. thought it was jimmy that was the guy on the ground he's the the, the, oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, crap right. reporter that he wanted on hap is the editor and jimmy's the guy going around and their newspaper is called the evening rocket which is hilarious mm-hmm. and that's one of the things you get into with this story that are fun because a lot of simac stuff holds up incredibly well out of its era this story is definitely corny 30s <laughs> Mm-hmm. it's very corny 30s and if you can't enjoy that and laugh at it for what it is then you're not gonna dig a story like this but if you can laugh at the outdated stuff then you're gonna have fun with this story um and what was your first initial thoughts seth upon reading reading this because this is one i assigned to you for this purpose so yeah yeah had yeah, you I heard mean- have you heard I had never heard before? of it. No, okay. no, I'd never heard of it. And the idea of mixing sports and science fiction, it, it has kind of a dicey history. You think about like the, the weird corny arena football stuff from the Starship Troopers movie, um, you know, or Parisi Squares on Star Trek The Next Generation or Pyramid in the Battlestar Galactical, Galactica series. Sorry, getting tongue tied. Um, but here, I th- one of the important things I think to, to mention here is that this is 1938 when the story comes out the first broadcast of nfl the nfl on television was in 1939 so there's there was not the kind of sports fandom that we had at least for 
football, right? You either went to a game or you had no idea what was going on. Maybe you saw the scores in the paper, but yeah, it, it wasn't in the consciousness in the same way that, that it is now. Certainly um, baseball had, had already been around for a hundred years, but you know, football was relatively new on the scene. Yeah. I had that thought. Had Isaac Asimov ever watched a football game before? Right. Well, had, had Simak ever watched a football game before? Cause I'm, I'm reading this and it's describing the plays in the game. And I think is that how football worked back then? I, I I'm not really familiar with the the yeah, changes. The, I know that at some point they had to. There was a rule change to allow the forward pass, um, but I think it was before 1938. Yeah, the most um, not understanding what makes football work uh, in the Simak story is when he said that the score was 49 to zero and it was the greatest game ever played. And I'm like, right, <laughs> right. Like that sounds like a crappy game. game. <laughs> it's the worst <laughs> game ever played. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that I, so I had the thought like, well, maybe Asimov saw, and he lived in Brooklyn, so maybe he saw a high school game or something. I don't know, yeah. but like, would, would a young Isaac Asimov give a crap about that? He'd be back at the candy store or behind the counter reading his amazing stories. Yeah. Well, he'd be more likely to like be a Dodgers fan if he was a sports yes, fan at all. Uh, yes, yes. I, mean, I, I want to uh, pipe up because I actually know a little bit about this. Um, uh, awesome. This, See, that's why we have you here, Alex. Yeah. Yes. So, um, Asimov was a baseball fan. Um, okay, you know, he, he talks about filling entire notebooks of, with baseball scores um, when he was around this exact age. So he was into uh, at least one sport. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know offhand if he ever mentions football, but I actually have his memories right here. And I can multi multitask a little bit and I will look up to see if there's anything about football in his memoirs, which, <laughs> which cover essentially every day of his life. So if you ever saw a football game or thought about football at any point, you know, he, he will mention it here. So, so let me see what I can find. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Well, while you're doing that, uh, Seth and I will uh, talk more about the story. Yeah. So the other thing, David, is, is, um, did science fiction writers not really know much about planetary physics and geology and all that kind of stuff? Because I feel like the idea that the Martian team would have some huge advantage makes no sense at all to me um, because they're from, they're from a lower gravity planet. So if they played on earth, they would be at a significant disadvantage because of the higher gravity here. Um, so it, like, there's a lot of it that is just 1930s science fiction nonsense to me. Exactly. Which is great. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, I mean, at the time, C.L. Moore was, and we just covered this in the last episode of Chamblou, you know, we got the Marsh, the Venus swamp people and, right. and the Martians. So I, you know, here's the thing though, there is mention where he talks about a planetary scientist basically saying like, he has somebody mentioning the idea that Mars might not even contain life or there's right. one of the characters when he goes back in time, there is some mention of that. And it's yeah, interesting. It's a to flashback see. to, uh, yeah, to I think, Hap to... in a lecture, right? Right. Yeah. And it is interesting to see how the science evolves in this because I love looking for these details when I read oh, old yeah. science fiction. Like, for example, I recently read uh, The Daughters of Earth by Judith Merrill, and there's a lot of references to Pluto in it. And mm. it's surprisingly accurate oh. <laughs> what she says about Pluto. It's not perfect, but it's surprisingly accurate. And then what's interesting too, is I, I know I recently saw like Brian Collins on Twitter posted a thing about who's reading an Edmund Hamilton, um, a novelette and it was from 1929. And of course it talks about Neptune being the furthest out planet mm. because Pluto hadn't been discovered yet. And, right. and long before it was discovered and then demoted, you know, so it's gone back into being correct, which is weird. <laughs> um, but uh, so it's funny because these types of things, I think, are for, for the people who, who are into this science. I don't know how you feel about it, Seth, but I like these things. I like seeing these things oh, yeah. in, the, in the old science fiction. And um, I don't want writers to update it. Um, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, speaking in, in, as the host of a, adapted science fiction podcast, right? There's times where we talk about, does it make sense to modernize something and to, to, to do away with some of the obviously wrong science? And there's an argument to be made for making a retro science fiction movie and just letting it be absurd. Well, yeah. you, sir, you, sir, are speaking my language. Um, but and, Alex, um, did you find anything? Uh, so a couple things, yes. So uh, Asimov does not mention football anywhere uh, mm -hmm. in a meaningful way in his memoirs. So you can we can rule out that 
that possibility. Um, I, I will say two things. Number one is that I know less about football than I know about the Gernsback era science fiction magazines. Uh, so you can, you can <laughs> kind of like see where I'm coming from here. Um, I thought it was a fun story. You know, I, yeah. you actually do not need to know anything about football to enjoy the story, which mm -hmm. I actually wasn't sure about. I, I was a little bit apprehensive going in, you know, for that reason. But had you um, read it before this? No. So this is interesting. So I, yeah. I knew about I knew the story. Um, I, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss further, you know, the way in which this story is relevant to Asimov's career. And so I, I knew that part of the story. I don't think I'd ever gone back and actually read it. Um, so it was it was fun to, to read it for the first time. Um, because, uh, yeah, like you can definitely see, I mean, I, I don't want to like jump ahead of ourselves because we're going to talk about Asimov in a second. But, you know, it, it's a fun story. It's well paced. And um, the one thing I wanted to bring up is that, you know, you talk about, yes, maybe the Martians would not necessarily have an advantage over the Earthlings based on gravity. But, you know, the, the point of the story or like one point is that, you know, uh, humanity has gotten soft. Right. Like over right. time, everything is automated. You know, we have machines that do all of our work for us. And so we have to go back in time to find, you know, humans who are tough enough to, you know, yes. uh, stand to up against real the Martian man. players. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> this is interesting because this is a very Campbellian idea. You know, this is mm -hmm. an idea that Campbell actually talks about in Twilight, which is probably his first really good story, which is, you know, it's, it's sort of like um, I had a friend who compared it to Wally, -E, you know, the idea that we have, um, you know, all of our needs are satisfied by machines. By machines and so mankind or humanity has, has kind of forgotten how to do basic things and, and I think this is an idea that Campbell goes back to again and again so this might be one reason why he he bought this story yeah well and I see it at because um, I'm one of the I work at a school here in San Diego and I'm one of the drivers that drives for field trips and stuff and I would tell you a lot of the young people are co consistently amazed that I don't use GPS to drive anywhere <laughs> and there are people I have lived in San Diego a lot. Some of these people have lived in San Diego their whole lives and they don't know how to get anywhere. And it boggles my mind. And so when when he, this part of the story was something that I certainly related to <laughs> and I felt like um, Simak was like way ahead of the ball on that one. And it's interesting to me that so I it's been a long time since I read Twilight. I read Twilight like I had a best of John W. Campbell that I bought in the nineties and that I somehow lost over, over the years. And I remember reading twilight and remember it being good, but so you think Campbell hit on these themes earlier than Simak? Do you think it's one that he was that maybe because some Simak was targeting Campbell as an editor. Do you think he was going for these themes specifically? Um, I mean, uh, it's a good question. I mean, Twilight, if I recall correctly, came out in 35, I want to say. It, it's been a little while since I looked at the... Um timeline but you know so so this is this is a very Campbellian idea that he had published in you know like a few years before the story came out um yeah. whether this is you know Simak like or, or Simak like really trying to like go after what he knows Campbell will like um I, you know what I, I don't I don't think so I I think that later on you absolutely do see writers writing for Campbell and writing to Campbell's uh interests and his assumptions in, in very obvious ways you know this to me it feels a bit too early for that to be the case. Um, it, it could very well be that he kind of arrived at this premise uh, independently and Campbell liked it because it happened to correspond to some of his own interests or his ideas. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think it was a deliberate choice. Yeah, and then we'll eventually also have writers writing as a middle finger to Campbell. <laughs> Right, right right like yeah but but again this is year one this is year one of Campbell's year editorship. one and everyone's excited yeah yeah so um there let's see there's some fun things now there's some little details that I think are really important first of all the year is 2479 I'm um the Martian team is called the Red Warriors which is funny um uh you know maybe the league would make them change their name <laughs> um <laughs> Did you see, by the way, I don't know if anybody saw this. This is new on Twitter, but the this is the first game of the Washington Commanders today, right? Where they mm. changed their name. And th throughout the stadium, they were selling merchandise. And one of the merchandise they had was um, a big W mug. And then it had the state of Washington because somebody was not <laughs> smart enough to know <laughs> that to not order these mugs or design these mugs with the state of Washington for the Washington DC commanders uh, merchandise. But anyways, I thought that was funny today. Um, but so their name is the red warriors. 
uh, which is a clever team team name for for a Martian team at the time. Um, now the I thought it was interesting that the uh, Earth team was green and gold, which is of course the color of the Packers, which um, would have been um, the local team for him at the time. Um, I like uh, there's a part where he's talking about the fans drinking in the crowd and they were getting gut rot on Martian Boca, uh, which is fun. There were fights in the stands. Um, fans were chartered on a ship from New York. These are all details that I think are kind of cool. Um, the evening rocket being the name of the paper is, is hilarious and awesome. And the exact quote was, you don't get a hell of a lot of muscle when you're pushing a button. <laughs> Right. word for word quote um and i do love that when the story comes out um the 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 there's newspaper boxes and the newspapers are still coming out in boxes and people are putting in coins although he does mention that the newspaper comes with photos on what is called visiglass which is awesome 1930s technology um, yeah but the papers still come out with the the ink wet on them as well mm -hmm. so it's physical papers right and uh with pictures in the visiglass uh which man that was really fun the stadium on mars is called um gunja tot which is an interesting name um but these are all like kind of fun 30s details but i think these first few sections of of the story are absolutely hilarious. They, I, I think he was writing this intentionally to be funny. It's not, so there are parts that are funny just because it's out of date and weird, right? But there's parts that are definitely meant to be funny. The idea that the editor selling, sending Jimmy to the, you know, like get in there and talk to that coach, you know? And it's funny because there's no way to read the early parts of this story without that kind of voice in your head you know right like, jk simmons is j jonah jameson Jimmy. yeah yeah i mean you cannot read this without that early mm -hmm. on in the story now the story does change tone which is interesting because also i didn't realize it was going to be as long as it was it was longer than i expected when i started reading it yeah me too so it also has a tonal shift once the time travel gets involved and you get some more serious things. Oh, and you know what I forgot to do? As I have some pictures of some of, we should look at this for a second. This is the table of contents for the issue of Astounding. I think we should backtrack a little bit and talk about what was in this. So this was July, 1938. This is one month before who goes there, by the way, right? Yeah. So, um, and it's interesting because this won the Retro Hugo. Um, and Alec, you're involved in that process of the Retro Hugo thing, right? Or am I wrong about that? Or Not not super involved, no. Okay. I mean, I, I definitely take an interest in it, but I, I don't have any uh, formal uh, association. Okay. Well, but this is, this, is, this is a very interesting issue for a lot of reasons. I don't know if you want me to like comment on some of yeah, those go, stories here. Yeah, go, go. Yeah, please, nerd out. <laughs> Yeah, so so a couple of things just kind of leap to mind when I look at this. Um, so this contains, along with uh, you know Rule Eighteen, it has the first uh, you know science fiction story by uh, L. Ron Hubbard, um, who oh, you know that's plays the first. Th this is so dangerous to mention. This is the first story that uh, Hubbard publishes in Astounding, um, and this is a story that Campbell is not super sure about because it, it, it's also a funny story. It, it's not uh, great, but it, it is well written uh, by thirty standards. Um, and, and, you know, I don't want to get into the whole Campbell Hubbard story here, but um, Campbell's essentially told to work with Hubbard and, and told to publish what he submits because the publishers want stuff that's a little bit more fun and a little bit more accessible, uh, written by a, you know, a writer who was popular with, with readers at the time. Um, and so Campbell kind of reluctantly publishes, you know, this, this first story by Hubbard, but the two of them become very close. So this, this is a big deal. You know, this, this is an interesting moment. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is that it has the uh, conclusion of The Legion of Time by Jack Williamson, which is a really good story. You know, this is, you know, um, one of my uh, favorite stories from this period. 
and you know, to me, this is sort of like, you know, people like date the golden age to like various times. I think you could make a pretty good case that like the Legion of Time is the first sort of true golden age science fiction story. Uh, it really holds up. I think mm -hmm. Jack Williamson, another person who was there at the beginning and there after the end. Um, so yeah, so this is a good issue. This is an issue that if you were a fan um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll get to like Asimov's reaction in a minute, uh, you know, you would have been like, okay, this is, this is good. This is pretty good stuff. And it also has an article by DeCamp. Mm -hmm, um, that's right. Yeah. And, um, Rick, and also me... uh, Arthur McCann, by the way, who has a um, science fiction feature article, that is a Campbell pseudonym. So he is still writing for the magazine <laughs> under right. another pen name. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, see, that's why we have the expert on. <laughs> um, let's see. And then um, this was the cover of the issue so this is the point where i was saying um it would be good to watch on youtube <laughs> um and so the the cover story was the ray cummings voyage 13 which is interesting not the jack Blake. well i guess that's already been two in two issues and he has yes the top up there yes and there, there is there are some cool at least one really cool cover for legion of time that that would have been a couple issues before this right and then um What's the story with Ray Cummings? I know he's a name I've seen a bunch of times, but was he was he was prolific in that era, wasn't he? Yes, he's not someone who figures prominently in my book. I think he kind of fades out around this time. Um, I, I don't think think he and Campbell ended up being that simpatico um, because yeah, like I am looking in the index of my book as we speak, he is not mentioned. So you know, again, this is this is where you hit the limits of my expertise. Yeah, that's okay. And the next thing that I wanted to point out was the, the first really scary ad, um, <laughs> which was the, the scientists proving <laughs> through torturing rabbits that Listerine wow. cures dandruff. Wow. Um, and this was a full page ad with this scary mad scientist guy like up there um, talking about how 76 got, percent got quick relief at a new jersey clinic which is interesting hmm. um so this yeah one ads. little one little tidbit here uh yeah. you know is, is that um so the ads for astounding they were not sold to astounding uh in particular these were ads that were sold to all of street and smith's magazines so the same ads would appear in astounding and in the western magazine and then the, you know the adventure magazines and campbell hated this like the like campbell was annoyed by this like from the beginning and it wasn't until i think 1950 that he finally was able to start getting ads that were targeted toward his readership so that's why you see the dandruff you know like uh shampoo ads and the hemorrhoid you know relief <laughs> ads that um you know really dominate you know the magazine during this period all right and here's what the first page of rule 18 looked like um a rule defeated earth teams in annual earth mars football game till a coach pulled the prize bright trick of quite literally all time was the tagline and um yeah and this this hilarious artwork apparently that's the martian fans i guess um yeah. in in the artwork yeah it says the martians took over new york city after a manner of football victors since immemorial parading through the streets and grotesque ten-legged zimba mascot <laughs> okay Weird. david i wonder you know and and alec you too did you get the impression that the Martian football team was made of humans from Mars, not Martians? Oh, wow. I, I definitely got the impression they were Martians, but okay. um, yeah, I don't I know. Do Actually, I, 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 could, I, I could be wrong. I always pictured, I don't know, for some reason, I thought this was a, you know, a colonies kind of thing. It's the, it's the civil war game between Oregon State and University oh, wow. of Oregon kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I mean, obviously, they're not Martians. They have too few arms. So... Mm -hmm. From well, the Glass Room series. Yeah. Yeah. I I I started thinking as you did, Seth, but then eventually I was like, once they said the Martian Drylanders, that mm. was when I was like, oh, okay. The, the, these are that's these interesting. Are Martian football players. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to quickly mention, I, I just looked this up because I'm doing research for this uh, you know, podcast while we're talking. Um, the art uh <laughs> that we you just looked at is by Charles Schneeman 
who was a pretty prominent artist during this period. He, he did the cover of A Legion of Time that I mentioned earlier, which is really good. And he um, was a Staten Island native and uh, that Campbell kind of like recruited to do more stuff for the magazine. Hmm. Yeah, and there's two... Like you said, the, the art is tremendous. Yes, yeah, yes. There's... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun to look at, you know, and, and again, hmm. like one thing I want to kind of like not um, you know, understate here about Rule 18 is that um, we mentioned it's a fun story, you know, and we've been kind of like listing the ideas that it, it, it has, which are kind of funny. It's also like well-paced, right, which is unusual for this period, you know, like often you will see a story that has a fun premise and a fun illustration like this, and reading it is just kind of like, kind of like a deadening experience. It, it just kind of like <laughs> drags and it's like not well written by, you know, any standard, you know, this is like a, like a well-paced, well-structured story. Okay, and I think this becomes important later on. So I yeah, just wanted to kind will of underline that point. Yeah, that will become important to this point. And then there is another illustration um, later, which is um, Jimmy wearing some very short shorts, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, watching, um, I believe, this is him uh, back in time um, researching like the story, I believe, um, researching the time tunnel, which, um, you know, is the time travel device. And then um, that's kind of nice art. I just, his legs, I, I don't know what's going <laughs> on there. Uh, uh, and then the last page of the story does have um, an ad for bourbon. Wow. <laughs> which is, <laughs> um, mint Springs. Evidently cheap bourbon. Yeah. Keep the change. Um, <laughs> which is a great, great ad. Um, but that's that's what I wanted to share visually. That's what so people can see what it looked like um, nice. inside Astounding. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did you read it on the archive, um, Seth? Yeah. 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 So you saw the original. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used to think I always would want to read like a newer version or whatever, but I have now, I've now come to the conclusion that it's better to, yeah. <laughs> to read it in its original uh, form because it gives it the spice and the feel where you get the ads and all that. Yeah. So. The Internet Archive actually does also have a copy of the, I can't remember what it was called, Autumn something um, and other stories that it was recollected into. Okay. So, and you can find it on Amazon as well. Oh, I did not know. I didn't know there was anything that was. Yeah. Still... Like the autumn land and other stories. It's probably not like in print. You can find it used, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The autumn land and other stories. All right. So. so the story appeared and it was read this. We've gone through the issue. What a great issue it was. Um, and a, a, a couple of issues later, so it would have been maybe two or three issues later, um, Asimov wrote a letter, and all I've got is the, is the quote, um, the specific quote, but if you have more, Alec. Um, That's really oh, all there is. It's, it's a long yes, letter breaking down yes, everything so, that was in that issue. Yes, so, so he devotes maybe a couple of sentences to the Rule 18. I mean, do, do you want to go ahead and read that quote? Uh, you can read, well... If you have more of the letter, I don't have the whole quote. I, now that we've talked about the rest of the issue, I am kind of interested in what he said about the, about the rest. Yeah, of the no, I mean, I, I do have the, if you want to give me, want to give me a second, I can pull up the original letter. Sure. I, I want to give a little context here. So Asimov at this point is, I believe, 18. All right. So he yeah, is, please he is give young. Us context. Right. <laughs> he, he is he is a young guy. OK. And working um, at the candy shop. Yes. So, so this is actually really important. So you talked earlier about kind of the similarities between modern online discourse and like the letters columns that, you know, you're, you're reading here. And I think this is actually worth pointing out with this letter because, you know, Asimov, you know, in these letters to the editor, he, he kind of takes on this tone, this kind of like um, know-it-all tone, like a wise guy kind of tone, you know, that I think is him kind of like just trying to imitate letters he's read in other magazines, right? There's mm -hmm. kind of like a like a voice, right? That fans tend to develop when they're writing, you know, it's sort of like the, the, you know, I mean, go online and read, you know, reviews of like anything, you know, like this sort of like snarky, um, uh, you know, tone is one that Asimov kind of um, is going for here, right? 
Um, well, and, and it was common, Alec, too, for for writers in this era to develop relationships with the writers or with the letter writers who really, you know, champion their stories. Um, I'm just reading Bob Robert Block's autobiography, and you know, his relationship with Lovecraft, of course, is famous. You know, mm -hmm. and it's all just because Bob Block was one of these people who consistently wrote to weird tales, saying, "More Lovecraft, please." Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, what's interesting here is that, so this is, uh, you know, like a funny point in Asimov's life, because um, so he is, as you say, working in his dad's candy store, and he is reading these magazines uh, at the store, right? He is, he is taking them very carefully down from the newsstand, reading them without, you know, messing up the pages, and then putting them back so they can be returned or, or sold. Um, and so he is reading magazines. He has just submitted his first story to Campbell at this point. I, I looked it up. He, he went to go see Campbell in person for the first time in June of 38. Okay. And I, I think, I don't, I haven't gone back to that exact uh, line in his memoirs, but I think he may have actually picked up some advanced copies of the issue in which uh, Rule 18 appeared when he went to see Campbell for that first mm. time. Um, and so he's already oh, I like- I love kind these kinds of details, Alex. Yeah. This is great. So, so he's already kind of edging into, you know, the idea, you know, he's a fan, also wants to be a writer. It takes him a long time to sell his first story to Campbell, but he's actively sending stories in as we speak. But he is not yet uh, connecting to fans in person. Um, he is he is writing letters. He's reading letters columns. You know, there's probably some correspondence going on. But um, he he's famously not gone to a Futurian yes, meeting or anything. Yes. So I, I I looked this up this morning. I, I did a little bit of research before you know I, I came on the air here, and um, he he actually doesn't go in uh, to his first Futurians meeting until later this year. So the letter that we're about to, to talk about, you know, this is a letter that Asimov is kind of writing. You know, he's just typing away at his, uh, you know, his, at his house in isolation. He is not yet sort of a member of the organized fan community, but he is sort of like acting the part, right? He is, he is kind of, um, I would say he's impersonating, but he is, he is cultivating this voice, right, of the fan, the wise guy fan who is going to point out, you know, the problems with the stories that were published and pick his favorites and, you know, criticize the ones he doesn't like. So, so this is kind of the context, you know, that um, I think is important to establish before we get to, you know, the, the two sentences that he writes about uh, Rule 18. Um, so I do have like the letter up here and just giving it quickly, you know, for example, he, um, he liked Legion of Time. He says, now that we have the entire thing, he's going to re revise his rating from five stars to four and a half stars. So he, he didn't think the ending was so, was so good. Um, he really liked Hubbard's story. Okay, and this is actually interesting, right? Because everyone kind of wants to dismiss Hubbard and rightly so, you know, as, as sort of like a serious science fiction writer. But Asimov was a big fan. You know, he really liked these early stories and he was, um, you know, a Hubbard fan up until, you know, like I would say for the next like 10 years. I would say uh, I love Final Blackout from this era. Yeah. I think it's incredible. And um, uh, what's the fear is great. Yes. So, so, so yes, you know, and then again, it's kind of like a side issue here. You know, I don't want to get too distracted, but, you know, Hubbard is a writer that people enjoy, right? And that people like Heinlein and Asimov and Campbell are, are, are fans of uh, during this period. Um, and then he gets, I mean, I'm going to skip over some stuff. And um, then we get to Rule 18. I mean, should, should I just go ahead and read his uh, critique? Yes. Um, so he says, I can't help uh, sticking out my neck. So here goes a violent knock at Clifford D. Uh, Simak's story, Rule 18. Aside from its general incoherence, I don't think sports and science mix. Offhand, I can recall only two other stories of this type in the two years in which I have been keeping my catalog, Raw for the Raja and Positive Inertia. Both were flops. So that that's that's his that's his verdict. He says it is incoherent and doesn't think that science and sports mix right and we'll talk about that his catalog in a minute which is awesome that he's keeping a catalog yeah. um uh which i'm sure is part of those memoirs um that that catalog mm -hmm. so um yeah so he it may not seem like this is a big deal right but it's a big deal because this is the thing that causes um Samak like responds to this letter he actually writes asimov to say you know what didn't you find mm -hmm. coherent about this now we'll we'll get back to that in a second you read um seth you found positive inertia did you read I did. it yeah yeah well what did you think of this story 
So that story is kind of uh, almost the inverse of the absent-minded professor, the flubber story, um, mm -hmm. where this this man discovers a way to induce more inertia onto someone. And so he can be kind of like juggernaut in X-Men um, where through a treatment and then a belt that controls it, his scrawny little son can be a star in a football game uh, to win the heart <laughs> of his fiance and to win over her father. Um, and of course things go quite awry, but it's entertaining. Yeah. I looked at it. I did not get a chance to read it, but yeah, um, I it, it ends up malfunctioning and he plows himself into the ground with his greater inertia and almost dies. So, <laughs> so Asimov was a fan of that story and, and the uh, R. No, he thought it was a dud. It sounded oh, like, he, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry, he he cites that as an example of why, an example uh, sports of why you science don't science do fiction that. Don't right, right. Sorry. I do think it's amusing that it's, it's also football. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if it was a baseball story, maybe. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Um, and then uh, we couldn't find you. You didn't find I didn't find the uh, Art no. Raja, so we don't know. The title's a little dodgy, so <laughs> yeah. maybe it's best we didn't find it. Uh, not that, yeah. You know, we'll talk about the dodgy. Well, maybe we should talk about the dodgy ending before we get more into Asimov. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there is the last line of the story, and we were talking about this before you came on, Alec, um, is is very cringy. It's just the very last line. And I had the thought, I wonder if Campbell tacked that on. Um, or like, because it doesn't, that ending seem, doesn't seem very Simak to me as somebody who's read a lot of his work. I'm not saying he couldn't have done something that was, so the last line of the story for people who don't know is he's basically, you know, is it Jimmy or is it? I can't yes, remember. Jimmy. Yes, Jimmy has gone back in time and he's watching um, a bunch of Native Americans play, I, maybe lacrosse. I don't know, like they're playing a game or something, or doing something. It's and then he has the thought, well, I could be a god to these people, you know, and it's like, boo ha ha, you know, kind of ending. Right. Not the not the people he was around then he was going to head south into mexico right into aztec right. territory or mayan territory and and yeah he said he'd make a, uh, a newspaper reporter would make a good god for these people uh, and and he actually uses the old name of the washington football team yes right yeah yeah and then um uh, and so this ending it's a good story this ending is an ouch ending yeah. after <laughs> like a good story um and there's no way to know because Simak hasn't said anything about it. So yeah. he has a lot of times when the editors mess with things, the writers will say like, yeah, I didn't like that ending or they changed yeah. this, they changed that. So maybe he didn't. Uh, it's because we probably would have heard about this famously, um, you know, like Lovecraft hated the edit of, a, of at the mountains of madness and astounding and had they had he hand corrected his copy which was what they used to to fix it we'll talk more about that in the at the mountains of madness episode two episodes in the future nice. um so i should save that uh, I, anyway. I had one almost not charitable interpretation of it but he does jimmy does mention you know basically i could go down to where the aztecs are and warn them about the spaniards coming and so, so it's almost like he's like, it's going to be, you know, a little bit of philanthropy here. Of course, it's all still for his personal gain if he's going to set himself up as a god. Right. And also it's the character doing this, not necessarily some Mac saying right. this. Right. Like it's the character. Um, you would think, you would hope a newspaper writer from the 25th century or 23rd right. century would be um, a, a little, little more enlightened. A little more enlightened, but yeah. you know, he was hired by Hap Fallsworth, so maybe, maybe not. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a terrible ending to a good story, or at least, I mean, it's not, as a story, it's not a bad ending. It's just, it's cringy politically. So yeah. there's that. So, but that's not, that wasn't Asimov's problem with it. His problem was the coherence. And the reason why I think he thought it was incoherent he talked about in his autobiography, correct? Um, and which is, and because the important thing is that Simak wrote to Asimov and said, hey, 
um, I'm sorry you didn't like the story, but you know, tell me, tell me why. I I want to know why, which is interesting that an author at that point, you know, because a lot of times now you see the way people act on the internet. If like I had a guy um, tell me to get a fucking life yesterday just because I told him his interpretation of Blade Runner was slightly off. Um, so you know, just. <laughs> And by the way, all he said what he, what he said was is that the androids wanted to kill all humans, and I said it wasn't all humans. Yeah. And because I said it wasn't all, he told me to get a fucking life. So Samak was being pretty forward thinking, saying like, yeah. "Hey, you know, tell me what what how I can improve my story." So well, um, plus he knew where Asimov lived because he left his address. Yeah. <laughs> Got to track him down. <laughs> said, "Don't you say that about my story?" Exactly. Um, which obviously now, so but this played it now. The reason why this letter is important is because Asimov will go on to say that this was a foundational thing in his life that Simak was a huge influence on him, and that these letters and talking to him and these communications, I believe that you know, and he said that he used the tricks of the story once because when he went back and read it a second time he he realized what he was doing and a lot of times the story if you read it the first time you're still trying to figure out what's going on you know i i i can say you know we were just mentioning do androids dream of electric sheep like i've read it four times now and it makes a lot more sense to me on the fourth time that i've read it than the first three times so he went back and read it again and he had this influence now what would alec you know you've written the book on isaac asimov (laughs) this really would we have a foundation would we have a pebble in the sky would we have had these works of art from asimov would we have had the writer that we did if he didn't have this exchange with simak is it is does this make rule 18 canon because of the role it played for Isaac Asimov? So I actually have the, 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 the page from his memoirs here. Um, and I, I want to just read this paragraph, right? That where he talks about what is it in the story that he actually um, finds useful. And he says that he rereads the story and he says that what, you know, um, uh, Simak had done was to write the story in separate scenes with no explicit transition passages between them. And he says that he wasn't used to that technique. So the story had seemed choppy and incoherent. But the second time around, he says, I saw what he was doing and realized that not only was the story not in the least incoherent, but also that it moved with a slick speed that would have been impossible if all the dull bread and butter transitions had been inserted. OK, so so what he's talking about is the story structure, which is which is true. Like if you read the story, you know, um, you know, uh, Simak starts with like um, an account of the football game. Let's say he cuts to the newspaper office. He cuts to the time travel, the, the scientist who invents time travel. And he cuts back to the coach, you know. So, so he does this kind of fun technique where you're seeing all these different vignettes, right? That, um, you know, it's, it's, it's I, I, won't, I won't go too far here, but there is some, something cinematic about it where he is just, you know, cutting quickly between different sequences and he's, he's omitting, you know, the transitions, okay? Which I think is like, pretty basic stuff, you know, that good writers learn how to do. Uh, But I think this is the first time, you know, Asimov starts to think that, oh, you can just like not talk about how you get to a certain character. You can just start the scene in the middle, you know, which is a good technique, right? Um, Now, now Asimov, I got to say, he is not a great writer early on, all right? It takes some time to get good. And this is very clear because, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, his first meeting with Campbell, you know, and, and he brings Campbell the very first story he ever writes. So this is like you know, this 18 year old kid who has just typed up a story and is going to bring it to Campbell in person. All right. And it gets rejected, obviously, you know, he's not at the point yet where he can tell a story. And I think he tries like maybe 11 more times before he sells his first, um, you know, story to Campbell. He's written a couple other stories that have gotten published in the meantime, but, you know, the, Gastelmoff is not someone like Heinlein, who I think kind of just emerges out of the gate as a major talent. You know, he, he is kind of growing up in public and you read his first few stories and they, they are not that great. I think Hubbard, for example, is a better writer than Asimov at this point in their careers. But the, the one story, you know, you mentioned some, some other works of Asimov's, you know, that um, 
you know, you ask, like, would we have these stories? So the one story that I think of, and I, and I, I believe that Asimov makes this connection uh, to uh, Simak, although I, I can't find the reference right now, is, uh, is Nightfall. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. Nightfall is kind of his big breakthrough. All right. And the story here is that he goes to see Campbell and Campbell reads him this quote from Emerson, you know, saying, you know, if, if mankind, you know, would see the stars for the first time in a thousand years, how would they wonder and adore? And, and um, Campbell asks Asimov, you know, what do you think would really happen if, uh, you know, mankind saw the stars for the first time? And, and Asimov says, I don't know. And Campbell says, I think they would go mad. So I want you to go home and write that story. And, and Asimov later says he's not sure whether Campbell had been saving that idea for him or if he had just been the, the writer who happened to walk into the office on that day, you know. But, you know, for whatever reason, you know, this story is That's a what... good thing Hubbard didn't walk in. Oh, I don't my God. Think that story would work with him. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yes. Yeah, so, so this is interesting, right? So, so this is like one of these like kind of chance moments that I find so fascinating because it really does make Asimov into a, a first rank writer. Like, like the story is, you know, his first cover story, I believe, you know, he gets paid a bonus for the first time. Readers like it a lot. It's, it's later voted one of the best science fiction stories of all time. And if you go back and read a, a Nightfall again, you see that he is essentially doing what uh, Simak does, uh, what Simak does in the story, right? He is, starting with some characters and you know honestly you know the, the, there is not a lot of action in, in nightfall it is just a bunch of people talking in, in a room or in different rooms but you, he's cutting between these conversations and he, you know there, and there's a there's a ticking clock right unlike uh, in rule 18 you know the this this eclipse is going to take place in like 6 hours or something you know so so there's this like great you know, sort of built in suspense mechanism. And he's doing the sort of cutting back and forth thing, you know, that he actually does not do in a lot of other stories. I, I think Nightfall, you know, it's dated in some ways, but it still reads really well in a way that a lot of his other stories from this period don't. And I think it's a large part because of the structure he uses. You know, it does have this kind of like cinematic cross cutting technique. And, and I think you can absolutely trace that, you know, back directly to Rule 18. Right. And I, I think, well, first of all, the story of how Nightfall happened is one of my favorite parts of Astounding, actually, um, because uh, much like you, I love these little moments. So like when I'm researching PKD, that's one of the reasons why going to Berkeley was so important to me, because I wanted to walk the streets and go to the places where like these things like actually happen. And actually knowing the the and taking the walk from his like apartment to where Anthony Boucher's like $1 science fiction classes were, were important to me because you get to see it and you get to really feel it. And the fact that Asimov was having these meetings with Campbell and just walked in and happened on with Nightfall is, is fascinating. And it's really, well, and we couldn't do Nightfall for this series because it got published in the forties. Uh, but I do think um, Nightfall is a transitional story for the golden age altogether, right? And if this story of Rule 18 has such a positive and such a huge impact on Nightfall, that adds to the argument for it being canon, in my opinion, and being an important story. Um, and this role and this influence that it had on Asimov. But I would also say that, wouldn't you say that the style is a little bit on a grander scale, kind of how foundation is set up too, because foundation is kind of like desperate. I mean, I know it's because they were different stories written at different times and they were put together as a fix up, but in a lot of ways that style is kind of what he was using for foundation as well, a little bit, I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, he, he you know, the, the one thing that he, he does refer to is not just like the way that um, uh, uh, Simex uh, like structures these stories, but also his style. You know, he, he refers to his um, easy and uncluttered style, and, and I think again, like he is finding his voice, right? And and you know, Asimov, and, and you know, eventually he gets better. You know, but he is never what you would call a great pro stylist. You know, I, I feel like someone like Heinlein was actually a better writer in many ways, and you know. A lot of the stories, let's say like the iRobot stories, you know, these are stories that you kind of read in spite of the style, you know, they, they are not uh, otherwise, right. you know, and again, I'm, I'm speaking as a fan, right? Like this is, you know, and there are exceptions. I think some of his later stories are well-written. Um, it, it is not true for a while, right? But he does sort of arrive I, at I this. I like the um, Caves of Steel, Naked. Yes, 
Yes. Yeah, so that period, he is definitely growing, right? He's growing. Um, you know, I think the mule is well-written. I think, um, you know, God themselves, uh, a centennial man. I mean, there, there are some really well-written stories, you know, later on. Um, but, you know, the minimum, the, like the best you can say about his style at this point is that it's, it's kind of um, inobtrusive, you know, it's sort of this like uh, very matter of fact, plain style, which, um, serves it you know like him very well in, in a story like nightfall or foundation right it, it doesn't really serve him that well in stories where the underlying idea isn't that strong but i i do think you know he sort of credits uh you know simak with um helping him find that voice you know finding you know something where story comes first you're not trying to like heighten the language you know with a lot of rhetorical flourishes you're, you're just trying to like tell the narrative as simply as possible and i think you know that that's you know absolutely something that he credits uh, 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 Simak with um, inspiring. Now, uh, for, for the listeners out there, if they want to hear more details about Simak and his career, um, I suggest that you go to Seth's podcast. He goes there and listen to the episode that he and I did on Waystation. And I'm going to mention Waystation a little bit in relation to this because we have been talking for a while, so I do want to kind of wrap up a little bit. But we need to talk about where Simak, Simak went from here um, because I think the fact that he started his career in 1932, publishing his first story, and he was writing up until his death in 1988, I believe he died. Um, and, uh, but, you know, that 1964 Hugo for Waystation, you know, we talked a lot in that episode about all the heavyweights he was nominated up against, including Kurt Vonnegut, by the way. Um, and do we really think that Waystation was better than Cat's Cradle? And no. Do we think he deserved the Hugo? I feel like the Waystation Hugo was a bit of a lifetime achievement award, um, which is fine. Kurt Vonnegut also was not going to be coming to the convention, and they knew Clifford Smack was, and the voters are all going to understand that. I, I think at the time, um, and it's really interesting too, because there was a recently a series on um, Amazon called uh, Night Sky, which just really felt like, I think it was just an accident, but it, it had a similar setup as Waystation. However, like Simak, outside of those of us who are really interested in the golden age, he's kind of a lost author. Um, you know, he's, for science fiction fans, for serious science fiction fans, he's part of the canon. He's one of the greats. He's a grand master. That being said, his career is, you know, is, is kind of being lost. What I want, starting with Seth, you've read a couple some some acts now. Are you you've read Waystation and this? Is that what yeah, you, yeah, okay. that's it. Are you curious now from reading these two things? Are you going, when you finish your podcast and you're all caught up on the Hugos, is, is Samak one of those authors you're going to deep dive or are you going to read again in the future? Yeah. I mean, I'm not much of a deep dive person. I, I'm, I'm famous for starting book series and then moving on to something else. So um, I will say though, that, you know, on your recommendation on when we did that podcast, I did purchase City. So I have it sitting there at the top of my, after I finished the podcast project, you know, get back to these books and maybe do episodes on them. But um, just kind of, it's it's one of those things where I see titles by Simak come by on, you know, cheap books and, uh, and you know, I usually grab them. So, yeah. Yeah, and Alec, what, what's your um, reading history with Simak? Have you read much of his work beyond this era? I mean, I know he's not been a focus of your study. Right, right. Well, you know, so when I when I was writing Astounding, I made a list of like the 500 or whatever stories I should read to kind of like know what was going on, you know, during this period. And, and so I read, I would say, four or five of his stories. And I, I like them a lot. Um, it's been a long time since I've, I went back to them, but I actually did go back to my notes. Um, and the one that I thought was actually really good, it's called Eternity Lost. Uh, I believe this came out in 49. And um, it's a life extension story. Okay. And, and I think um, I, I, I made a note of this story because, you know, there are times when you kind of forget that some of the same issues that science fiction is like discussing now, you know, were being talked about in like the 40s. And life extension is one of them, you know, and I think this is a fun story that kind of does kind of talk about what is the consequence when you become effectively immortal 
you know, how does that affect you, you know, psychologically, practically, and, and you know, from whatever I can recall, like, it's a very, you know, inventive treatment of that theme. Yeah, and I, I would say I'm probably the one of the three of us that's read the most Simak. And um, the, the three that I particularly, well, time and again is very good. It has, it's kind of a proto PKD kind of paranoia time travel story, um, which is m the closest to action adventure you're going to get. I, I have a Jack Finney book by the same name. Yeah, um, it, I believe that's the title. Okay. And my Samac books are on the other side of this bookshelf. So I can't just look at, at, at it. But um, the ones that I really like, uh, Cemetery World, um, which is considered one of his pulpier ones, but I actually think is great. And this is a very far future science fiction story where Earth is kind of like this mythical graveyard planet that, you know, people like the rich people send their ashes to, to, mm -hmm. to the home world. It's, it's a really beautiful cool concept um that's one that i would love to update in a screenplay i I've, I've thought about it a bazillion times um but his masterpiece really in in my mind although i don't well and then there's ring around the sun which is about um the invention of limitless energy and what it would do to society with uh, it starts with the whole book starts with what if a light bulb was created that never burned out? And that's like the inciting incident of it, Ring Around the Sun. It's a very, uh, very smart book. And then, um, of course, Way Station, I, I do recommend, I do think is great. But his masterpiece is City. City was written mostly in the 40s, um, in the late 40s into the early 50s. It's a series of short stories that were fixed up and, you know, tied together into a novel, but it works incredibly well as a coherent piece. And City, the basic concept of it is a far future story where uplifted dogs and robots have basically inherited the earth and sit around a campfire and debate whether the human race actually existed or if it was just a myth um it is a one of the things you hear about samak is that he writes these very pastoral very midwestern science fiction stories and that's definitely the case with way station but uh city is also very pastoral and it's a beautiful science fiction novel i do not use that word often um but as somebody who's a dog person <laughs> And a science fiction fan, um, City is one of my all-time favorites. If Hollywood dumped a bazillion dollars on my doorstep and said you could do anything you want with it, I would do an animated City in a heartbeat. Um, like, because you couldn't do it live action. We we're talking talking dogs and robots. But um, let me just say that it's a really powerful piece of work. And I will always, always back City as one that people should read. Ring Around the Sun, Way Station, and I, I think are all great. He did write several fantasy novels during that era. And one I've been saving because I've heard it's really good is he wrote what he considers his most experimental book and an answer to the new wave, uh, a science fiction novel called The Choice of Gods. I've been saving it. I have not read it yet. Uh, I've been saving it for the right time. Um, because we have a finite number of Simac books. So I've been saving that one. But I just wanted to give a shout out to his other work, his later work and what came. He was never the success that um, Asimov or Heinlein or some of these bigger names were, but he always had the respect of the science fiction community. He also wrote, um, I know he had a short story in Dark Forces, which is one of the all-time greatest horror anthologies and what i thought was really cool about that is that um because of a discussion that i had with editor doug winter at borderlands we talked about samak and we talked about his inclusion in dark forces and it was no little thing that he was in dark forces it was considered um a, you know a sign of respect that the horror fiction community also had for clifford samak um, and by the way, there is references, Stephen King makes references to a Samac novel in, um, I believe it's Cell, um, but he, 
name drops. I can tell you that getting name dropped by Stephen King, I know from John Shirley that his book sales went up when when Stephen King just randomly mentioned the cyberpunk work of John Shirley. <laughs> and suddenly he had all these sales that he didn't wow. have. So I think some act being mentioned in the Stephen King book is no little thing. Um, but anyways, that's all I've got to say on that. Um, if there's anything you guys want to, uh, starting with Seth, is there anything that, what was your overall experience of reading Rule 18 and your second SMAC experience and how did reading Waystation before this like kind of play into your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, having read Waystation and having such a positive experience uh, of that reading the book and, and talking with you on the podcast really made me, you know, very open to reading more SMAC. And I really do love old science fiction um like like reading it and just just kind of trying to put myself back into the shoes of someone picking something up off the rack and how exciting that must have been to read things in the pulps and i feel like we we're maybe starting to to come back around to to some of that kind of pulp era production that we get with with magazines like uncanny and and other places where people can get published without having to write an entire novel. Cause I, I do, I recently read, um, there's a graphic nonfiction history of science fiction by uh, Xavier Dolo. Um, and, uh, and I feel like there was some loss when we kind of transitioned from the pulp era more into the novels era where that's how you would make a living. Um, and so, yeah, I, I thank you for, for having me on for this, for thinking of me and, and letting me get to kind of immerse myself in that, that era and the art and, and everything. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Well, we, we didn't even talk about the mob connection. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't even talk about the, uh, the organized crime connection in the book where the, where the mob paid the oh, yeah. scientists to create the time travel so that they could win money on the game. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, yeah, it's a funny um, corner to it. I mean, I, that's the thing is the story is very funny. It, yeah. it, it's, it's very comical. Yeah. Um, Alec, your experience overall in reading Rule 18. Um, yeah, I, I had a great time. You know, I, I had this like funny experience where um, for the you know, period of like maybe two years, I was intensely engaged with this period because I was writing yeah. Astounding and um, read tons of stories, just kind of like lived in that era for a while. And I kind of I, I moved on a little bit. You know, I, I spent yeah, the last few years. Mr. Fuller. I, yes. I have the book I'd hold at the library. Oh, good. I will be reading it soon. OK, yeah. Well, I, I was going to say, you know, I had to kind of like switch gears and, and like move to this like, you know, Fuller biography, which was a you know huge, huge project um, that kind of left me with like very little time to, you know, think about the science fiction stuff. But every now and then I kind of get an excuse to go back to these magazines. You know, I was at Worldcon, you know, this past weekend and that was really fun. I did a bunch of panels about 1946. And so I read some of those stories again. And yeah, no, the timing was perfect because I, I love these magazines, you know, just the, the experience of going back to like, you know, the original scans and like looking at, as you said, the illustrations and the ads and the editorials, you know, I, I, I love it. And um, yeah, so, and this was a great uh, sort of um, story to encapsulate that feeling because it's sort of, as you say, it's, it's you know, it, it, it's a good story, you know, clearly important, influential to Asimov, worth reading now, but very much rooted in that, that aesthetic and, you know, sort of the, the um, classic mid thirties science fiction, you know, like vibe, you know, it, it's all over this story. So I had a really yeah. good time reading it. 80 plus years ago i mean it's to really yeah. think about like how much time has passed in no time these stories this story is going to be you know pretty soon it's going to be 100 years old you know mm -hmm. i mean the, it's crazy to think about the passage of time through these magazines it's just it's really cool to to see i know a lot of people have been doing that recently with the queen like you know like oh look at all the things that have happened since the queen took you know, but I, I do the same thing with these science fiction stories that I, I think about like when they were. So yeah, um, Alec, I will have to have you back on when I read the Buckminster Fuller. Um, that is really exciting. Tell people how they can find you online and find your book. Yeah. So, um, you know, the name is Alec Neville Ali, which is pretty unique. So if you want to look me up, you know, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I, I have a contact page on my blog, very open and eager to hear from people. And yes, uh, astounding. My previous book uh, is still available. So, you know, if you like this stuff, please check it out. And uh, my, my next or my current book, uh, Inventor of the Future, about Buckminster Fuller just came out last month. So, you know, please look for that too. 
Yeah, um, I am very excited to read that. Um, when you were researching it, I was very much looking forward to it. <laughs> Good. Good. Um, it's Seth. Uh, yeah. How can folks find your two podcasts, which I listen to both? They're great. Uh, I think, oh, thank you, David. Um, the easiest place to reach me is just uh, at Hugo's podcast on Twitter. That's where I do most of my my tweeting. I do have a personal Twitter, but I never log into it. Um, and Alec, I'm just just calling it right now. If the Frozen Hell movie ever gets made, you've got to come on Take Me to Your Reader and, and hit us with some knowledge. Oh, God, yes. So Frozen Hell was optioned by Blumhouse uh, yeah. years ago. Uh, I have no idea where that stands. Every now and then, you know, John Carpenter gets asked about it and he's like, I don't know either. So, you know, I, I, I really hope it happens. I, I have yeah. no financial stake in that that project, but it would be super cool to see that, you know, on, on the big screen. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And uh, we'll be... And then I should say that if you've made it this far, the next episode of this podcast series on the 1930s science fiction. Um, so episode one, if, you, if you've if you only listened to this one, you should go back. Episode one of the series is Gem Blow by C.L. Moore um, with, Greg, with author Greg Cox and um, sci-fi fan writer Cora Bullart. And Cora always brings it with the history. Um, that episode is coming out as we record this tomorrow. Um, and then the second episode is a repress of episode of an early episode of the Dickheads podcast about the Harry Bates story, Alas Thinking, which was Philip K. Dick's favorite short story when he was a young pulp reader. So that's why we're covering... Uh, I'm redoing that. And that was a really weird one for me to listen back to because I read it so long ago in that episode. So it was almost like I was listening to myself talk about something I didn't remember. Mm. So it, it was very weird, but I went back and reread the story. It's very good. It's a great 30 sci-fi story. Then this episode, and then episode four will be who goes there um, by Don A. Stewart slash John W. Campbell. And that episode, the guest will be Mary, uh, author Mary San Giovanni, Brian Keane, and Tim Levin um, talking about who goes there. And then the, ep the last episode in the series will be At the Mountains of Madness with Cody Goodfellow and Fred Ludnow, who is a scientist who um, is working on, I believe he's writing a book called The Science of Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. um and there may be more guests on that one but that will be the last in the series and has so, he figured out the reanimator formula yet yeah i don't <laughs> think he has yet but uh but i'll ask him about it okay um but yeah so that's the podcast series on the 1930s um maybe sometime in the future i'll do the 40s i don't know but i just really wanted to do that um to represent the 30s so thanks everybody for joining us and thank you alec and Seth for making time out of your day. Um, thanks for joining Postcards from a Dying World. We'll see you next time. Thanks.